Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's pod, Republican leaders reject a bipartisan commission created to investigate their own attempted murder on January 6th. Democrats finish a new analysis of why they nearly lost the House in 2020. And NYU law professor Melissa Murray is here to talk about the big news that New York State has launched a criminal investigation into the Trump Organization, as well as what's ahead for the Supreme Court and more. All right, let's get to the news. The House voted on Wednesday to create an independent, bipartisan commission to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. And since one Republican congressman recently compared the attack to a, quote, normal tourist visit, and another referred to the rioters as, quote, peaceful patriots, here's a quick reminder of what went down that day. a couple of peaceful patriots on a normal tourist visit, Dan. Um, there I would are, say uh, that chanting treason while committing treason is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's really just uh, hanging a lantern on your problems. Okay, so there are still a lot of questions uh, that haven't been answered about a day that left five dead and 140 police officers injured. Um, how organized was the attack? How did the rioters breach what should be one of the most secure buildings in the world? Why did it take the federal government so long to send help? How much responsibility does Donald Trump bear? What was he doing and saying while the attack went on? Who else was involved? After uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, Congress set up the Warren Commission to investigate. They did the same thing after 9-11 with a commission made up of 10 members, five appointed by Democrats, five appointed by Republicans. That was the model for the 1-6 commission proposed by Democrat Benny Thompson and Republican John Katko that passed the House on Wednesday. Except this time, only 35 other Republicans voted for the commission. 175 voted against it, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. And now it heads to the Senate, where Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has already said he opposes the commission. Why, Dan? Why are so many Republicans against a bipartisan commission charged with investigating their own attempted assassination? Three reasons, I think. One, this is what Donald Trump wants. And they have yeah. latched themselves to Donald Trump, no matter where that ship is going. What he says goes. Donald says Donald Trump says jump. Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy say how high. He, he released reason, a, he released a statement yesterday calling it a Democrat trap and telling everyone to vote against it. Or two days ago, I think, right before the vote. Who who knows when his statements come out? When they arrive to us by Raven, we don't really know anymore. Um, <laughs> is he talking about the one six commission? Is he talking about Kirstie Alley? We don't know. It could be anything. that's. That's a real thing that happened last night. If people don't know, he put out a real statement thing. in defense of Christy Alley after Christy Alley was on, believe it or not, Tucker Carlson's streaming show on Fox Nation, which is also- Oh, I didn't know the us. context. Thank you for providing us the context of why he, offered, why he issued that statement. The Tucker Carlson show, but he does it in street clothes as opposed to- <laughs> uh, st- It's very, it's I highly right. So like I don't his, recommend his you bow tie it, is a little loose? <laughs> no, 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 no. He's got on like, uh, he looks like he robbed a Brooks Brothers for casual wear. So- <laughs> Anywho, the second reason, which is even more important than that, which is the idea that the election was stolen, the idea that they we're going to have to keep up the big lie is a critical predicate for the voter suppression laws they're trying to pass around the country. You have to if you start if you allow a bipartisan commission to look at and say this was a legitimate election, this was a big lie, that undercuts your ability to steal future elections. And then I think Related to that, and the third reason I think is the most scary is 
sticking to the big lie is the a key ingredient to being able to do what we are is very clearly their plan, which is to put themselves in position to try to steal the 2024 presidential election, even if Joe Biden or the Democratic nominee wins the popular vote in the Electoral College. And so to admit that this was based on a lie, that the election was legitimate, is to undercut all of those things. And to so therefore, they do not want a commission, independent, bipartisan, with credibility, to undercut that very important part of their plan going forward. I, I agree with all that. I will say that I don't think that they started in a place where they were 100% against this commission. So like, I'm very interested in, in Kevin McCarthy throwing John Kako under the bus. So John Kako is a the Republican who negotiated this deal on the commission with the Democrats. He is a Republican. He's the chair of the Homeland. He's the um, ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee. He's more of a moderate Republican from New York. But McCarthy basically deputizes him to negotiate a deal with the Democrats about this commission. Kako basically extracts all the concessions that McCarthy and the Republicans asked for from the Democrats. The way this commission is set up is just like the 9-11 commission, Republican members and Democratic members each appoint five members. The Democrats appoint the chair. The Republicans appoint the vice chair. But even though this committee has subpoena power, they can't even issue subpoenas unless the chair and the vice chair both agree. So the Republican appointed member and the Democratic appointed member or a majority of members all agree, which means you need some Republican appointed members. So like Republicans got basically everything they asked for in this commission. And then McCarthy just decides to throw Kako under the bus, which Kako brought up during one of their private um, caucus meetings, apparently. <laughs> like what, what, what changed, do you think? It's always important to remember the Occam's razor of analyzing McCarthy's actions is he is weak and stupid. Yeah. So it could have been both. Probably a combination it, of both. It's, it's combination. It's this is. Let's not forget. McCarthy gave a big defense of Liz Cheney remaining in the leadership and helped ensure she remained in leadership two months before he tossed her overboard. They were operating on sort of shifting sands here in the Republican Party, and so I think McCarthy did obviously does not really see around corners or, but. Gave put Kako in the position to do it. Thought a commission was okay; it would be independent. They'd have some control. They'd get some concessions, and then it was became very clear that that would be unacceptable in MAGA land. And he reversed and and sort of cut the limb off behind uh, behind Kako. I will say, you know, you mentioned that they're afraid of Trump. Um, they're also afraid of right wing right wing media. Our pal Tucker Carlson, when you were just talking about, said that um, Republican voters should know the name of every Republican congressman who voted for what he called a poisonous hoax. Um, there's also something else here I think that's going on. You get people like Pat Toomey and Susan Collins and Mitt Romney, all of whom voted to impeach Trump. Um, and now they're saying that they're still undecided on this commission, even though they voted to impeach Trump. And John Thune in the Senate, Senator from South Dakota, sort of gave away the game the other day when he was asked about the commission. And he said, anything that gets us rehashing the 2020 election, I think, is a day lost on being able to draw contrast between us and the Democrats' very radical left-wing agenda. They think that this commission is going to hurt their chances in the 2022 midterms because they have this theory, and this is the theory across the Republican caucus that I think unites the crazier Trumpers with some of the more reasonable Republicans, can't even use that word anymore, but the Susan Collins and Mitt Romneys of the world, which is that they all believe, and Republican strategists are all telling them, that um, if, they, if they appear divided, it will hurt their chances of winning the midterm. And so that they can't talk about 1-6. They can't talk about 2020. They don't want to talk about Trump. They don't want to talk about Liz Cheney. Republicans are trying to avoid talking about all of this stuff because Republican division does not help them narrative-wise heading into 2022. What, I agree with all of that, but one difference that I want to make clear is I don't think the Republicans are scared of Trump. I think that gives yeah. them way too much credit. They, mm -hmm. they think that it is in their political interest to abide by his lies. And it doesn't matter. Like, he can't tweet anymore. Like, no one even knows about his statements. Like, I had to dig deep to find the Christie Alley statement. Um, <laughs> what... What matters still is they think that they need his turnout. They need him. And so they have two choices. They can either take the time and energy and the have the strength to try to 
talk the base off the ledge or they could follow him over the ledge and always path of least resistance for these guys. And so that's what happened. I think the other thing around Toomey and Romney and Collins is it's always important to remember that the Senate is basically high school for old rich people. They <laughs> have to they have to go to lunch together once a week and sit around tables. And there's only so many times that these folks will do something to anger all of their peers. And this is what and so they voted for impeachment. They have said they've said other things. They defended Liz Cheney and they're like, here's one where it just feels like easier to go along with the group and to create some sort of permission structure for yourself to not have to get into an argument with John Cornyn or something over while you're trying to get applesauce in the in the lunch line or something. God forbid. I mean, I also think they are they are betting on the fact that they kill this thing now that also like no one's going to be talking about it come the midterms. And if this thing goes forward, then potentially we will still be talking about it around the midterms and they just don't want that. I mean, the other thing is McCarthy specifically is concerned that he will have to testify in this with this commission about his phone call with Trump, where remember the former president reportedly said to McCarthy, well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are as rioters are storming the Capitol where Kevin McCarthy is sitting. <laughs> and Trump said that to him. And I'm sure McCarthy doesn't want to testify about that. I love that uh, <laughs> there's a lot of great things around this. Congressman Greg Pence voted against the commission. Greg Pence. Greg Pence voted against the commission to investigate the people who wanted to hang his brother, the former vice president. What a shitty brother. Maybe maybe they don't like each other. Everyone else's brother is automatically better than Greg Pence. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's unbelievable. So, uh, and then the one other, so there's a couple of Republican complaints about the commission. They, they, they say it's partisan. We've just talked about why it's absolutely not partisan. First of all, it was passed by 35 Republicans. Second of all, the commission requires bipartisan consent in order to even move forward at all. It can't do anything with just Democrat appointed, Democratic appointed members or Democratic appointed staffers. It needs cooperation. So it's a lie that it's partisan. Um, they are saying that it's duplicative. John Katko himself, the Republican that negotiated the bill, made an impassioned floor speech where he talked about how it's not duplicative. In fact, he knocked down every single Republican concern. Um, he mentioned that like the commission couldn't interfere with ongoing criminal investigations that are already taking place, which is what Mitch McConnell complained about. Uh, he also pointed out that the current criminal investigations aren't sufficient because they won't tell us how to protect ourselves from such an attack in the future. He even said that the commission could look into other instances of political violence. One of the crazy complaints from Republicans like Kevin McCarthy and others uh, is that the uh, commission is not going to look into political violence committed by the left. And in fact, here's what Marjorie Taylor Greene said about the commission uh, on the floor the other day. While it's catch and release for domestic terrorists, Antifa, BLM, the people who breached the Capitol on January 6th are being abused. The people who breached the Capitol are being abused. And what really should happen is that Black Lives Matter protesters should be investigated. That is the that is the fringe Republican position, I suppose. You know that like relatively unfunny meme that's like I made a bot watch ten thousand hours of Friends and wrote a script. Marjorie Taylor Greene is basically a bot who watched ten thousand hours of Fox. It's just like catch and release, BLM, Patriots, blah, blah. and Tifa just... terrorist, blah, blah. yeah, AOC, <laughs> yeah, that she is. It's just wind her up and watch her go. Um, all right, so what happens now? What what options do Democrats have? Presuming that the Republicans will filibuster this in the Senate and therefore prove to maybe Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema that the filibuster is not a tool to facilitate bipartisanship. Um, the option for the Democrats is to impanel their own commission, a special committee, much like the Republicans did on Benghazi that would have subpoena power and let them go investigate this as it should be investigated. Uh, what do you think the benefits and drawbacks of that are? The... The benefit is you would actually investigate it. You would have subpoena power. You would not be captive to Republicans. The drawbacks are there. I have read some speculation that a congressional committee would not would it struggle to get to subpoena a member of Congre Congress to testify before it. An independent commission would have more legal standing to do that. Um, so that is one potential drawback. 
I think in the ideal view of Pelosi and Benny Thompson and the people who had this original plan was that this really would be like the 9-11 Commission, which was a very serious endeavor. It had buy-in from the Bush administration. Bush and Cheney testified before it in, or they yeah. gave depositions for it. It released its findings in the summer of the year Bush was up for re-election. The, it was all serious people. And, but that was a different era and a different thing. This is the 9-11 happened nine months after Bush took office. The commission was looking at everything, including all the things that happened in the years before we had a Democratic administration. Obviously, the bulk of the responsibility for what happened fell on Bush's side of the ledger, but it was a global look and you had buy-in from lots of people involved. And there was a whole lot of things to look at. Here we have one lie pushed by one party, pushed by one president from that party. It does it is does not need that sort of bipartisanship. The other thing that I think might be a miscalculation from the Democrats is you heard some people and some members say in some of these stories, if it's not bipartisan, you're not going to be able to convince the Trump base, Republican voters about the truth of the big lie and what really happened. But I think that is a naive think that, conception. Think the, uh, I think that ship has sailed, my friend. Right. Well, I mean, it's just, it's... it's Horses just out of the barn. <laughs> politics has changed a lot since then. That even, even, let's say Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy got on board with this. And so you have – it is a joint report signed by the major, the minority leader, Republican minority leader, Republican minority leader in the House, and you put it out. Those people have one iota of the credibility of Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, Dan Bongino right. with the base of the party. So they it is spitting in the wind compared to what Fox News would do about this. So what – what we ultimately want to do is get to the bottom of what happened because like the 9-11 commission, the 9-11 commission was what happened and how do we prevent it from happening again? There is a very real risk that just a few years from now, we could be in the very same situation. There will be another big lie push, another close election, another situation where you could see the very same thing. happens. So how do you stop that from happening again? Both how do you, how do you push back against the spread of the big lie? And then how do you actually strengthen the capital and put in place this, the, the systems you need to ensure that a group of people can't storm the Capitol on a day like that. Yeah, I think that's a very important point that this isn't backward looking, that this is very forward looking, the need for this commission, because you know that the Republicans are already saying like, oh, we don't want to relitigate the 2020 election, right? We don't want to look back. But this is, of course, about the future. The, the other big difference between a committee, select committee set up by Pelosi and this commission, the 1-6 commission that's um, being debated right now, is the commission would have members appointed by Democratic and Republican members of Congress, but it couldn't include current Democratic or Republican members right, of Congress right. or any current elected official. If Pelosi creates a special committee, it's going to be all all yahoos from Congress. Now, you know, Democratic <laughs> Democratic yahoos too. We like them. Um, but, and look, they could have, a you could set it up so you have a majority, a Democratic majority on the committee and that the Democrats and the chair of that committee have subpoena power. But again, you're going to have a bunch of Republicans on that committee, or at least some Republicans on that committee, who will turn it into a complete circus, much like they did during impeachment. But again, I think you have to figure out, like, what is the ultimate goal here, right? Like, I don't, I actually don't think that we should have a political goal in mind here, um, not because I am, like, above that, but because I just... I, I don't think you're going to change that many minds on this at this point. But I do think there is another goal of, like you said, just finding out what happened and getting answers to these questions, which I do think is incredibly important. Norman Ornstein talked to um, Greg Sargent at The Washington Post about some other options aside from Pelosi creating a special committee. He also said that Biden could create a commission, that that makes it a little too close to Biden <laughs> if he does that. And then DOJ, like uh, under Merrick Garland, could maybe create a commission as well. And then Merrick Garland could sort of step away from it as attorney general and just let this independent commission uh, you know, operate on its own and maybe have a little more authority to subpoena people than your typical congressional committee. So he said that that was another, uh, another option too. But it does seem like, and I, Pelosi was kind of talking about this yesterday when reporters asked her about it, that she is at least thinking in the back of her mind that if this thing goes down, that she could create a special committee. There is this legend that sort of whenever anyone's been talking about this and the, and the Benghazi committee is been the the analogy that every reporter uses. It, we should note that it is a very imperfect one because Benghazi had already been investigated by several 
committees yeah. chaired by Republicans who had declared that there was that while there were mistakes made in terms of embassy security, there was no cover up. There was it, it was cleared of all um, sort of the uh, it sort of debunked all the Republican conspiracy theories. John Boehner created a special committee so they could keep doing that to appease the folks on the right. And then there's this view that it was this massively damaging political winner for them. And that's not as true as people think. It is The reason why it is seen is because that is where the existence of Hillary Clinton's personal email use came out. But that's a different it. – it's a very different situation here. It was not that they talked about Benghazi for years. That actually was a huge, I think, negative for them. If you remember the hearing that Hillary Clinton testified and sort of made all of them look like fools. I think to your – the thing that we should be, I think, realistic about is it is May of 2021. Mm-hmm. The idea that this is going to drive conversation for the next 15 or 16 months of the election is just – Belied by everything. We should always remember Donald Trump was impeached. We just had two impeachment this- hearings. We had two impeachment hearings. <laughs> yeah. No, I, so, I completely. I mean, it, what this is, is a very disturbing sign about democracy, the state of the Republican Party, the absolutely absurd position we find ourselves in. Um, but it is it is not the thing that is going to win the election. But we should get answers to protect people's lives because people's lives were almost, were lost on that day. I will say, to go back to a point you made earlier, it is also a another test of sort of the mansion cinema theory of the fucking filibuster and protecting the Senate as an institution. You know, this thing isn't dead yet. Um, in fact, just before we started recording today, Manchin told reporters he thinks there's still a, quote, very, very good chance of passing the commission. Okay, so you got McConnell against it in the Senate. Uh, you had seven, you need 10 Republicans to pass this thing. You had seven Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump. You don't even have them on board yet for this commission. Where the hell are you going to find 10 Republicans to support this commission? Unless, unless Manchin and Cinema decide that the filibuster is not more important than a bipartisan commission to investigate an attack on the very institution that they think they are trying to save by protecting the fucking filibuster. It might like my head is going to explode thinking about this. Well, think about remember the video of Mitt Romney barely running into that crowd that was in the impeachment hearing that feels like 100 years ago, but it was like three months ago. Yeah. And yeah, Mitt yeah. Romney, he was almost assaulted by that crowd. It was by the bravery of one officer who saved him is against it. I was trying to interpret what Manchin said. I think he is probably thinks there's some chance that there could be some additional concessions made to get mm-hmm. a bill that would have bipartisan support in the Senate. What, what, else, what else could they give at this point? I, I, like, do, do, do they means, want Trump? Do they want Trump on the commission? Is that is, <laughs> is that what they want? I mean, someone pointed out. Uh, I think I can't remember where I read this today, but you fucking Q and oh, it was in Max. He have to be on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> the five Republican members of the commission. Are the cast members of the five? <laughs> oh, Vice Chair Gutfeld. I do think, though. I think this is a good. Uh, this is a good test. If uh, you know, there's a lot of important things at stake here, but uh, around the filibuster and what Mansion and Cinema do on this, especially because they talk so much about bipartisanship. Um, well, here you have a bipartisan commission. What are you going to do about it? Ugh. All right. Enough about Republicans. Uh, let's talk about what Democrats are up to these days. The party seems hell-bent on trying to win the next election the old-fashioned way by figuring out how to get more votes. Uh, This week, Congressman Sean Maloney, the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC, presented a 52-page PowerPoint deep dive to House Democrats that analyzed over 600 polls, voter files, and state and local data in an effort to explain why Democrats lost 11 House seats in an election year where Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes and the party gained three seats in the Senate. So, according to Paul Kane of the Washington Post, who reported out the story, Maloney, <clears throat> Maloney basically lands on two reasons that the Democrats didn't do as well in House races. One, Republican turnout, uh, which just about every poll missed. And two, Republican attacks, especially on socialism and defunding the police. Uh, still, the congressman said that while, quote, the lies and distortions about defund and socialism carried a punch, the Republicans think it got them over a 10-foot wall when Trump's turnout gave them a 7-foot ladder. So Maloney was joined on the call by the co-chairs of this report, Representatives Jim Himes, Katie Porter, 
and Nakima Williams, who was just elected to fill John Lewis's seat. Uh, what's your reaction to this? Anything else interesting about this autopsy that I missed? Well, first, I think we should just give kudos to the House Democrats for doing this. Yeah. Oftentimes, parties do not want to face the uncomfortable questions about how they lost. And so this was a very, very good thing they did this. And I think the House Democrats have actually been very good about this. In 2000 and after the 2016 election, they actually did two autopsies. The DCCC did theirs. And then the members assigned Congressman Maloney, who was not yet the DCCC chair, to do an independent investigation. So you sort of were doing a belt and suspenders approach to see, because he would not have an interest uh, as the not, as the DCCC member there, to sort of uh, paper over some of the mistakes. And his, and I went back and read the reports about his 2017 autopsy, and he was very, uh, what he was hypothesizing then based on the information he had, it's turned out to be quite true about shifts in electoral coalitions, about the Democratic challenges in rural areas, about some of our challenges um, with Black and Latino voters. It was, it was very, it was, and I think, and actually played a real role in the success we had in 2018. The other point I would say from that Maloney brought up in his call, according to this report from Paul Kane, is that there was a over indexing of old media, that they struggled really to reach. Uh, black and brown voters and voters in rural areas because they were using too much, relying too much on linear, on television advertising as opposed to digital. Sing, um, singing your song, Dan. I know. Obviously, I honed in on the exact part that, uh, that, <laughs> I was, I, that I had makes it, me I was going right. to bring this up later, but you were just yeah. jumping right on it. I appreciate yeah. that. Yes. Um, I think, like, to be fair, in recent years, the C has been a little bit behind others in terms of moving away from television and to digital. But one of the challenges here, and we've talked about this in other contexts, is so much of the money came in late. And when the money comes in late, one of the only things you can do is just go buy up the remaining television inventory, especially because Facebook turned off their ads at the end. And so yeah. you really your only option was TV. But there is a broader philosophical shift in the party about how we allocate resources. And it's not just pay to digital. It's also what goes to organizing, what go, what is spent early on deep, or, deep canvassing and organizing. Um, but there's definitely like the, the model did not work. And there's some other reasons there, which I think we should talk about, but the allocation of resources is a very important one that needs to be applied going forward. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Maloney at one point said like, I'd rather invest in the next Stacey Abrams who's going to build a ground organization then, um, you know, spend more money on television, which obviously that's a, that's a, that's yeah, a popular that's right. thing to say. I'm sure. That's, <laughs> that's why if I were to get into stocks, I want to invest, I want to invest in the next Netflix, right? <laughs> the next <laughs> Apple. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. That's I'm yeah you got, you got to um, go through a lot of pets.com to get to that. Juiceros. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. So what the hell did the Democrats do about the fact that our polling keeps missing surges in Republican turnout? Maloney said, Quote, the Republican Party is betting the ranch that they can do Trump's toxicity without Trump's turnout. And I think that may end up being a terrible mistake. So there's, I guess there's two different things at play here. One is like, what do we do about the fact that our polling keeps missing the, the, the surge in Republican turnout? And then the second is, what do we do about the fact that there keeps being a surge in Republican turnout? I, I think it's, we'll just back up one step to talk about why the polling miss actually matters. And why yeah, it particularly okay. matters for the DCCC, you know, because if the media polling being wrong ultimately does not matter at all, it it's just, affects that's, that's our just expectations. For us. That's that's just for our own. All sweet it means patterns. is that we either get our hopes crushed or we're pleasantly surprised. It, yeah. No one's making decisions based on. Although I will say some, like donor, like grassroots donors are, like they thought a whole bunch of Senate races were winnable because the poll said they were, and they clearly were not. But what really matters is campaign polling. And the DCCC in particular, in addition to recruiting candidates and training candidates, what they do is they raise a bunch of money and then they go spend it on the incumbents they think are most likely to lose in the open, and then the Republican seats they think are most likely to be flipped. And if you have the wrong view of the map, you're going to spend money in the wrong way. And it was devastating in 2020 because we had six of the 2018 freshmen who were running a tough district lose by a point and a half. Because according to a world in which you had lower Trump turnout, those races seem safe. And then you poured a bunch of money into some seats we ended up losing by five, six, seven, eight points because you were just yeah. looking at a fun house mirror version of it. And so it's absolutely 
devastating in a world of limited resources being spread out. The, there's never enough money to spend on every house race. So you have to make some real decisions. If you don't have good polling, that's a problem. Like every other polling report that has come out since the election, no one has a good answer for solving that problem. I will tell, I, I'll give you an example of this. I ended up doing like speaking at a fundraiser for Abby Finkenhauer, like the week before the election. And I remember thinking, and, and Pelosi, it was a Zoom fundraiser and Pelosi spoke at it too. And I'm like, I was happy to do it because I love Abby, but I was like, why are we doing a fundraiser for Abby Finkenhauer right now? Like, first of all, she's up by a lot. Why is Pelosi here like this? And it turns out, you know, talk to her afterwards, after the election, like there was a late surge in uh, poll. You know, there was a late surge from her Republican candidate that they had completely missed. And the Finkenhauer campaign was sort of begging for more resources from the DCCC and from the Democratic Party that they weren't getting because the polling had led them astray for so long and sort of missed this last minute surge, even though they felt on the ground that they were in a bit of trouble, which is just a real world example of how polling can actually not just like throw political consumers off, but like actual people who are running political campaigns. Not great. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah. As um, they say. So I guess, so that's, that's the polling. I mean, the other big question here is like what Democrats do about Republicans calling us left-wing socialists who want to defund the police. <laughs> uh, since, you know, this report shows, like many others, that that clearly had some kind of effect, though we don't exactly know what and where and with who. Um, Dave Weigel and, and, and Griff Witt had a story in The Washington Post last week about how rising crime rates in cities are posing a political challenge for Democrats um, with Democrats who have progressive criminal justice reform agendas. So then on Tuesday, two of those Democrats won some pretty big political victories in Pennsylvania. Uh, Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner, who's focused on reforming cash bail, reversing wrongful convictions, ending prosecution for low-level crimes, won a primary election over his police union-backed challenger, Carlos Vega, by 65 to 34%, landslide. And then in Pittsburgh, Mayor uh, Bill Peduto lost his primary to progressive state representative Ed Ganey, who campaigned on equity and housing and policing and will likely become the city's first black mayor. So what did you think of Tuesday's results in Pennsylvania in light of the findings of the DCCC report? I think that they are almost wholly disconnected. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would have sent a very disturbing message to the party if Larry Krasner had lost. Because here he was sort of the, I mean, there's a documentary about him. He's sort of the poster child of a progressive uh, prosecutor who comes in running on a criminal justice reform uh, platform and then puts in place real change really quickly. And if he had lost a Democratic primary, that would have sent a message that I think would have sort of paused or slowed or even stopped the momentum among Democratic politicians for this very important criminal justice reform agenda. But what is happening in Democratic primaries or overwhelmingly Democratic cities doesn't tell us very much about what happens in purple districts, how it's being seen by independent voters or the voter or the, the gap between people in these House districts who voted for Biden and the ones who vote for House Democrats. Because that, like the House Democrats underperformed Biden in most places by a couple of points. In many cases, that was the difference. And so how do they view these things? And so I think it's a very positive for the for the actual and incredibly important goal of putting in place criminal justice reform legislation at the state and local level, those victories are very important. And I think it sort of will pause a growing narrative that will be completely upended depending on what happens in the New York mayoral primary in June if the if Eric Adams, who is the most uh, conservative of the on the, on these criminal justice reform issues, if he were to win that primary, that would I think sort of bring us right back to where we were before Tuesday. But I don't think it should give us a lot of indication of how these messages will play in no, in November in Virginia or November twenty twenty two. Yeah, I mean to me, the Tuesday results sort of speak to the ongoing march of polarization in politics, like. Just as, you know, Republicans in red areas are getting more conservative, Democrats in big blue cities are getting more liberal. And so when there is a primary in a big city, then there's a really good chance that the more progressive candidate can win that primary for the same polarization reasons that we're seeing, you know, um, Republicans in red areas um, vote for more Trumpy candidates. Um, now, so before we move on from the DCCC report, like, 
what do you take away from it in terms of like what the party should do, both in terms of like, we got this polling challenge, we got this Republican turnout challenge, and we got this challenge of Republicans, you know, using sort of defund attacks, socialism attacks, and often lying about those attacks as well. Before we do that, I just want to make one point just so people understand the tremendous structural disadvantage that Democrats have. Mm -hmm. We're having like there's an autopsy and we're talking about it. We lost 11 seats. House Democratic candidates won 4.7 million more votes than Republican House candidates. Yeah. They won the House popular vote by 3.1 points and we lost 11 seats. That is a just as Joe Biden won 7 million, the popular vote by 7 million votes and barely won a small handful of seats that gave him a sizable electoral college margin. Like that, Democrats are operating at such a structural disadvantage. That structural disadvantage is likely to get worse with the post census maps being redrawn and new seats in, uh, from the democracy haters in the Texas legislature and Florida and elsewhere. So just, we should just recognize that Democrats keep winning more votes and keep losing. And that is a problem that we have to address. Well, but how do we address that problem? Uh, we have to win elections in this fucked up system. Yes. <laughs> yes. But I just want to. We can never lose. We can never no, lose. No, I know. I just almost, of, it's like, how many times can we complain about the fucked up system in which we operate, well, which we are a I mean, structural disadvantage as a party? Because the only way out of it is to win an election. Or, yes, we have to win elections. We, it also would help if we would pass the incredibly important political reform bill, which would ban partisan gerrymandering and at least level the playing field. So just that would help Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, whoever else. Um, the thing that I, you know, I think back to doing uh, campaign experts react the YouTube series I did during the 2020 election, looking at all the smash hit. Ads. Well, smash hit. Talk to Elijah canceled. What? That's cancel culture. <laughs> Yes. I can't believe you've been canceled by Elijah. We're yeah, no, talk about that. Yeah, no one, like, we'll never know what happened at the end. I don't, it's like, it's a series that ended before it's time. Um, given a, given a show to uh, Tucker or Jesse Waters or something. That's, <laughs> that's right. I'm negotiating with the Fox Nation streaming service right now. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but one of the things that was interesting was we would look at all these ads from Trump. And they were all over the map about Biden. Like he's uh, in the pocket of China and he has cognitive decline and corrupt and Hunter and all of this. And then it's that was how it was sort of all summer. And then it sort of stabilized at the end. And then when we look at the Trump ads and the ads about Senate Democrats and House Democrats, they were pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Radical socialist police haters. That's it. Was, there was a there was a for you know for a totally fucked up party run by a moron run by a campaign staffed by grifting morons. There was incredible unanimity in the Republican message about Democrats. It failed on against Biden because he was so well known. Biden was so well known that was, that message did not stick to him mm -hmm. as it did to others. But for these relatively unknown House and Senate candidates, it mattered a lot. And Democrats, in part because of poor polling were running ads about tying candidates to Trump, who turned out to be a lot more popular in your district than they thought, or were running ads about COVID, which we thought was everyone's number one issue by far, when it turns out it wasn't for a segment of the population. And so there are two things we have to do here. One is we need our version for Republicans of radical socialist police defunders. What is our brand that we are going to use that is going to be in every ad, in every tweet, that's what the, you know, what we, we will say Republicans, what people, what our listeners will use on social media. Like, uh, I, don't, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe radical capital storming police haters. <laughs> well, I think there is a, there is a debate <laughs> that, in the party. That's not about, it. That's not it. But yeah. Yes. <laughs> but there is a debate in the party about this, whether it is you're tying them to Marjorie Taylor Greene and right. sort of Trump or, and extremism or, or tax cuts for the rich and, and all the rest. Yeah. Yes, I led. I there a lot more research has been done on this. I led myself to the latter because I think we have gr room for growth with working class uh, Trump voters who disagree with basically everything that the Republican Party is for these days. But that is what we have to. You have to figure it out, and then everyone's got to say it, and it's got to be. It, it's got to be in our paid advertising. It's meaning in our earned media. It's got to be in our social, and that I think that is the a number one priority. We have to also think through what our better responses are to defund the police. And I think we, I think a lot of people thought that they were missing the conversation 
by focusing on those issues. And I think in hindsight, they were much more powerful. Now, I don't, I want to sort of separate ourselves from the great um, New York Times debate of December 2020 when everyone would just call Ask Dan Hurden and tell them their points of like Connor Lamb, AOC, and all of that. But yeah. it is always, um, always, always have your debates in the in the pages of the New York Times. They're always more productive that way. They're yes, always, yes. Yeah, moves a lot of. Pages. It's easier just to do that than text each other, but. <laughs> Like defund police attacks and social attacks are not the only reason we lost, but they were clearly, and I think this is the point uh, Congressman Maloney was making, is they are, they are more effective than I think we thought at the time. So we have to go back and think about how we're going to deal with them going forward because they're not going to stop. Well, you made an interesting point is that they didn't stick to Biden because he's well known. You know, a lot of people have, have pointed out that one of the things that that helped Biden with his sort of moderate image is he's a he's an older white guy, right, running who's had a long moderate record. But, you know, we should point out that there was a lot of moderate white guys running in these House races who didn't win <laughs> and who these attacks did stick to. And I do think like, you know, investing more and in make in, in a lot of bio spots for some of these candidates and making sure they're more well known. Right. Like if we had known that there would be a more, you know, Republican surge in turnout, perhaps some resources would be dedicated more to sort of propping up some of these members and, and making sure that people know who they are, what their, what their stances are, where they come from, what their values are, um, than just sort of attacking your opponent. Because I do think that people knowing Joe Biden and knowing who he is and what he stands for really did help him weather some of the horrible attacks that that were leveled against him in, in the 2020 race. And for some of these House members, either they were freshmen or they were challengers and people in their districts just didn't know them and weren't familiar with them. So that when you attack them, and you spread a bunch of lies and conspiracies about them and you distort their record, it's easier to stick. JD, our friend J.D. Shulton, who ran against Steve King, um, his, his political organization just did a poll of rural voters. And they found nearly half of rural Democrats don't know they're getting stimulus checks. They don't know about the American Rescue Plan. And that speaks to the information gap, particularly in rural areas where you're getting uh, – in more Republican areas where there's more Fox News on the air, or there's more conservative local media, it's maybe a place where there's Sinclair. And what that says is that there is a huge flaw in a communication treasure that lies on the mainstream media to get your message out. It can't be we're going to put out press releases and do press conferences from the day we're sworn in until Labor Day of the election year. Most of these candidates, in my view, should be up with digital stuff now, sharing your... Yeah. Your what you've accomplished, who you are with voters at a low frequency, low you know, to the extent you can, you obviously you need to be able to raise money for this, but do that nonstop because you have to define yourselves before you get defined, and you cannot rely on the mainstream media to do it. And you should not be, you should not underestimate the power of the right wing ecosystem to define you negatively just because you're a Democrat. Yeah, it was even worse than you mentioned. So it's like. <laughs> It's this focus group. It's this sorry. It's this poll of like two thousand or something rural voters across all these swing states, and the, the good news is sixty eight percent of them support the stimulus checks, but only fifty percent of them associate those checks with the Democratic Party. Thirty two percent thought that they came from the Republican Party, and eleven percent didn't associate them with either party. That's where we're at, and that I mean that it raises an important question. I think because we have talked about how. Democrats' midterm strategy has been to just deliver benefits to voters that will improve their lives. Like, we got you shots, we sent you checks, we built your roads, we created a bunch of jobs. Please remember us on election day. Like, what if that doesn't work? <laughs> that's <laughs> what not if that's work. not <laughs> it's not gonna work. I, I think, mean, like, I I think, think there is in a there is a very important conversation to have about whether simply doing popular things is enough to win in an era of negative polarization. But do you think that the answer is do the popular things and then make sure people know that you're the one who did the popular things? Or do you think it even goes beyond that? The first, you know, to use Congressman Maloney's ladder analogy, there is no ladder without Joe Biden and the Democrats controlling the pandemic and fixing the economy. Right. That is that's, like yeah. we are. That's table doomed. stakes. Yes. So you got to have your table stakes. And I think you want people to know you did those things, but we have to to run an aggressive, strategic, re relentless, ruthless campaign defining who the Republicans are. 
Mm-hmm. Not it never stops. It drives a wedge right through their coalition. We people need to understand the stakes of this election, and the stakes of this election are not just are you going to get more stimulus checks, because one of what we talk about all the hurdles we have, but one hurdle we have is a lot of people in this country naturally default to divided government. They think that they think that that is better, in part just because they're skeptical politicians and it's a check on the system. But we have to make sure that people understand that th- that the Republican Party cannot have power again, that they are deeply dangerous. And we have to do that in a way that works. And I think that is going to end up being like everything that Joe Biden is doing and staying popular and helping the economy. That's going to get us to the point where we can see over that wall. I'm going to just kill this ladder analogy. I love um, it. But we're you know, if we're going to get over that and, and up and the historical and structural challenges we have going into this midterm, it is going to have to be because we came up with the absolute best message against the Republicans and we hammered them over the head with it for two years. Yes, totally agree. All right. When we come back, I'll talk to law professor Melissa Murray about the new criminal investigation of Donald Trump and what's ahead for the Supreme Court. So late Tuesday night, the office of New York Attorney General Letitia James released a statement that read, We have informed the Trump organization that our investigation into the organization is no longer purely civil in nature. We are now actively investigating the Trump organization in a criminal capacity, along with the Manhattan DA. We have no additional comment. Joining us to hopefully provide some additional comment on this and other legal issues in the news, uh, NYU professor of law and co-host of the excellent Strict Scrutiny podcast, Melissa Murray. Melissa, welcome to Pod Save America. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So as soon as that statement was released, I think most people without a legal degree had the same question, how screwed is Donald Trump? What do you think? Well, my first take on it was, wow, Tish James woke up this morning and chose violence. Um, so <laughs> you do it, you do not want to fuck with Tish James. I, you don't. Um, so I think this is a pretty significant development. You know, obviously we're dealing with someone who I, I think, like Mercury, manages to slip through most of the crevices of accountability that we've established in our system for wrongdoing. So, so this is not a slam dunk, certainly, but. The fact that this has shifted from a civil investigation to something where there's likely to be criminal charges, or or certainly it's shifted to a criminal investigation, means that in the course of that investigation into whether or not the Trump organization had improperly valued assets for purposes of loans and taxes, um, suggests that maybe they found something even bigger, um, whether it's criminal fraud or in in terms of valuing those assets, but something that goes beyond what would be obviously civil liability to something that is more damning and and indeed would require criminal intervention. And it brings to bear the offices of the state attorney general to the investigation that the Manhattan DA's office has already been undertaking. And so, you know, there is a kind of efficiency, um, economies of scale, if you will, of having these two very powerful state level offices join forces in this investigation. Is that common that the two offices would work together on an investigation like that? Um, I think it happens occasionally. I mean, again, this is a rather high profile situation, um, but again, often the, you know, the, the city, the Manhattan DA's office will be investigating um, violations of state law, which obviously concerns the attorney general. So it's not uncommon, but again, I think you typically don't see it with someone of this high profile. I mean, but but I think it's also quite unorthodox to have a former president be in the crosshairs of a DA or a state attorney general. So there you are. What do we know about the potential crimes they're investigating? You mentioned, you know, that the Trump organization may have both overvalued assets and then tried to undervalue them at tax time. I saw Andrew Weissman, one of the Mueller investigation prosecutors, tweeting about the Martin Act. Uh, What do we know about all this? So we actually don't know a lot about what the scope of the investigation is or what potential violations of law they've identified. They've been pretty close-lipped other than saying that they've shifted from a civil posture to a criminal posture. So, you know, Andrew, who is my terrific colleague at NYU, um, was speculating given um, the work that he has done with the Mueller investigation, what he knows of the Trump organization. But the truth of the matter is we don't really have a lot of information. And I think we are unlikely to have a lot of information um, until this becomes, um, you know, more fully developed. So not to get ahead of ourselves here, but 
Politico reported the other week that if Trump is indicted while at Mar-a-Lago, that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis might be able to step in and prevent him from being extradited to New York. Uh, is that true? Um, so Florida's extradition statute um, provides for the governor to intervene, to limit the scope of an extradition. And, you know, perhaps there, there is speculation that Ron DeSantis might be exercised to do so uh, for President Trump. And yeah, I, I don't know that that's really the big issue. I mean, President Trump has said that he's planning to move on from Mar-a-Lago as one does when one is finished with the summer and moves to one's other estates. Um, so <laughs> it's likely that he will be going to Bedminster in New Jersey. And I, I think, you know, New Jersey doesn't have the same provision in its extradition statute. And, and I, I think it's unlikely that New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy would be willing to um, provide the same kind of shelter. So yeah, I, I just don't think that that's really an issue going forward. Um, and certainly it would yield, I think, a lot of outcry from individuals if Ron DeSantis was seen to be sheltering someone from the rule of law. But, you know, again, this is where Flor we are. Florida becomes a safe haven for criminals everywhere. Um, before, before we move on to more consequential topics, I got to ask what you think about uh, the investigations into two of Trump's pals, Matt Gates and Rudy Giuliani. We got a guilty plea and a promise of full cooperation from Gates's buddy, Joel Greenberg, this week. And we saw the feds raid Giuliani's apartment and office a few weeks ago. I mean, I, I've said this before, but, you know, maybe MAGA isn't making America great again, but making attorneys get attorneys. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, you know, to be very clear for, for your listeners, um, Representative Gates and um, former Mayor Giuliani have not been charged with anything. And if they are charged criminally going forward, they are innocent until proven guilty. So like just just to get those caveats out of the way. That said, um, you know, certainly the Greenberg investigation and the change of plea and, and, his, and Joel Greenberg's decision to plead guilty to six charges when there were probably around 33 charges at issue suggests that there's going to be some serious, serious cooperation. And, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the focus of that cooperation is Representative Gates. It could be a number of other people. But the fact that we've gone from 30 odd charges to six suggests that he's telling the government a lot and telling prosecutors a lot. And to be clear, if any of these charges, um, if anyone else were to be charged and it were to go to trial, Joel Greenberg is not a great witness for the state. Um, his credulity right. could certainly, his credibility could certainly be impeached at, at any time because of the nature of the charges against him and his own background. Um, so I think what's really important here is the information that he gives up to prosecutors, if it can be corroborated um, with receipts of all types, whether it's Venmo or bank statements or other people who can corroborate the, the things that he's ex telling the prosecutors, that will certainly be significant. But again, um, it, it cannot have been a good day in Matt Gates's household on Monday when uh, Joel Greenberg pled guilty. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, let's talk Supreme Court. A very worrying development this week when the court announced that it will hear Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which is about the Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, this is seen as a case that could give the court's conservative majority its first big chance to go after Roe, uh, in which the court ruled that the Constitution protects the right to an abortion before viability. Can you walk us through why they might rule differently here and what their reasoning could be? Sure. So, you know, I, I think all of the individuals who have been up in arms about this and saying, you know, this is the end of Roe, like they're not being hyperbolic. I mean, this certainly could be the case that results in the overruling of Roe versus Wade. Certainly, the way the question presented um, when the court decided to grant cert in this case um, makes clear that. It, they are broadly looking at the full scope of their extant abortion jurisprudence, not some sort of very minor tinkering question. Like the, the question is whether um, all restrictions on pre-viability abortions are unconstitutional. And that certainly puts Roe squarely in the crosshairs. Uh, the reason this case is at the Supreme Court now is because of the changing composition of the court. So mm -hmm. when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated and confirmed to the Supreme Court in 2018, you begin to see all of these states um, putting out more and more aggressive restrictions on abortion. And again, it's sort of to push the envelope. They understand that the reception at the court is perhaps more hospitable than it's ever been to 
the prospect of overruling Roe. And so you know, you saw a huge spate of very restrictive abortion laws being passed. When Justice Ginsburg passed away in September 2020 and Amy Coney Barrett was very quickly um, slotted into her seat, again, more and more appetite for this fomenting because the court has gone from a five to four conservative majority to what is actually a six to three conservative super majority. And with that conservative super majority, what you also have is a diminution of the chief justice's authority to limit what the court can do and what that conservative majority can do. So last term in June medical services, the chief justice, who was no fan of abortion and made that very clear in 2016 in Whole Women's Health, um, where the court struck down a Louisiana or excuse me, a Texas admitting privileges law, he was in the dissent. Um, but in last terms, June medical services, which took up an identical Louisiana admitting privileges law, the chief justice joined the liberal wing of the court to form a majority of five. And then he sort of broke away and wrote his own opinion um, that, that raised, I think, a lot of questions about the, the scope of protections for abortion, but nominally upheld the abortion right. Now the chief justice is no longer the swing vote. Um, the liberals cannot use him to form a majority. They only have four with him and the conservatives don't need him to form a majority. They are, they're fine as long as they have the whole rest of the conservative wing of the court on board. And so his real authority right now is to join the conservatives to, to form a six majority um, and to have the authority as chief justice to assign the writing of the opinion. And if he joins the conservatives and he has the prerogative of assigning the opinion, I think what we might see if he is worried about what this looks like to the public outside of the court, um, we might see him join the rest of the conservative wing, uh, assign the opinion to himself for the purpose mm. of limiting it um, and, and making it a more narrow ruling. And, and I think that's likely because this is a case that is going to be heard on the eve of a midterm election. And John Roberts, above all, is an institutionalist about the court. He's a movement conservative. He's a Republican. He cares about the Republican Party, I think. And I don't think he wants this smoke as people start going to the ballot box and certainly not women. Um, you know, there is support for the idea of a right to abortion, even if individuals may disagree on what the scope of that right is. There's broad public support um, for reproductive rights and the right of women to terminate a pregnancy. And I don't think he wants this to be the position with which the GOP is associated when people go to the ballot box in 2022. Depending on uh, John Roberts to protect access to abortion doesn't feel like a great place to be in, but you do make a persuasive case that um, he could decide to, you know, use this case to write an opinion that potentially limits the scope of, uh, of what the conservative justices do. Well, so let, let me be clear, even if this opinion is narrow, it's it's a problem, um, right, right. you know, near, like you can like you can do what's been done over the last 20 years to just continue to constrain and constrict abortion access through more and more restrictive laws to the point where the right is really just a right in name only and women aren't able to access it. And I think that would certainly be the case and a narrower opinion that perhaps upholds the Mississippi law just sends the lower federal courts into disarray trying to determine whether bans on abortion at six weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks um, are constitutional. Yeah. So it's just a mess going forward. And more importantly, there are other abortion cases coming down the pike. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, the Sixth Circuit upheld an Ohio law that prohibits abortion when it is done for purposes of race selection, sex selection, or because of the diagnosis of some sort of disability or fetal anomaly. And that actually created a circuit split. Um, this Mississippi case, there was no circuit split. So the conditions under which the court might have taken it were perhaps a little more shaky. But with a circuit split on this trait selection abortion law, I think what you might have is the chief justice limiting this particular case um, before the midterm elections. And then after the midterm elections, then you have one of these trait selection challenges, perhaps, that really does allow the court um, another opportunity to finally deliver the death blow to Roe. So yesterday, President Biden's Supreme Court Reform Commission met. Uh, we both know some of the fantastic legal minds working on that. Um, not everyone is hopeful about the outcome. Brian Fallon of Demand Justice said the other day that it's doomed from the start. Uh, do you agree? And, and what's an ideal outcome in your mind? 
So I, I think people say that it's doomed from the start because a commission of 30 odd people is it's hard to get a consensus on anything. And I think that's probably right. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's it's a rather large and unwieldy body for coming up with sort of concrete solutions. Um, you know, what would be a win in my mind? I mean, I've said this before, I, I think I've said it again, but I think most Americans, certainly progressive Americans, um, may not really have an inclination or an inkling about how important the work of the Supreme Court is in cementing an administration's domestic agenda. Like, you know, you can get things passed through Congress. Um, you know, you can have the Senate and, and, you know, get your domestic agenda put forth, but the Supreme Court is where a lot of those legislative wins, executive orders go to die. And I think we have to do a better job as progressives of really making clear what the stakes are at the court and how the court, even though it is not a political body per se, how it interacts with politics, um, whether it's through the Senate where you know, they are charged with confirming judges to the court and the lower federal courts, or just in, in terms of the domestic legislative agenda that often is appealed to the court and the courts. And so I hope if nothing else, the fact that this has been surfaced and elevated to the point of a presidential commission gives individuals a sense of how high the stakes are for access to the courts and indeed the composition of the courts. Uh, any thoughts on whether uh, Breyer retire billboards are the most effective way to get the court's uh, oldest justice to step down? <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably not. Um, he, he's been very clear. You know, he was, I, I saw him speak on this a couple of years ago. And, you know, one, it's very clear he loves his job. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's, you know, certainly spry and fit and, you know, more than up to the task. Um, you know, it really is just a question of like, do you want to wait until you're in a situation where you are ready, but perhaps the political circumstances aren't ideal and optimal for you to step down. And again, I think it's a very personal decision. Um, no one wants to be told when to leave a job that they love and that they're good at. And, you know, I don't think billboards are going to do it. Um, I don't know what will will do it. Um, you know, maybe he's waiting for even more optimal circumstances. Maybe he's optimistic about the midterm elections and thinks that will be a brighter moment. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure bullying him into it is is the way to go. Yeah, so. I don't think so either. Uh, last question on a law that uh, South Carolina Republican Governor Henry McMaster signed into law this week that will force people on death row to choose between the electric chair or a firing squad, just horrific. Uh, do you think a law like that holds up in court? And, and what are your broader thoughts on the current state of the legal challenges to the death penalty that are popping up all over the country? So you know, it, it's interesting how the death penalty often intersects with the discussion of abortion. I, I think, you know, for a long time, those who have been pro-choice have noted the incongruity of being both pro-life and also pro-death penalty. Um, but I actually think now it's really beginning to get a little bit of traction. And maybe part of that is COVID, where you saw a lot of these states that passed restrictive abortion laws because of COVID, um, arguing that you know they were pro-life, but then you know refusing to lock down or refusing to be um, more forthright about mask mandates. Um, so I actually think there's this really interesting um, moment where people are really pressing this idea, like, you know, if you say you are pro-life, are you pro-life for the whole life? Or is this pro-life ethos more itinerant and selective and focused solely on what happens in utero? Um, you know, the South Carolina law is, you know, to my mind, wild. South Carolina will be one of three states, or I think just there are only three other states that actually permit death by firing squad. And I think there have only been a handful of executions in the last um, century uh, in the United States by firing squad, and they've all been in Utah. Um, so, you know, I, I think the sort of idiosyncratic nature of a firing squad execution um, may be, you know, evidence or you know, corroboration for a challenge um, going to the Supreme Court that, you know, this is not a safe or effective um, type of method to be used for execution. And the fact that so many other states have switched to other forms of execution, whether it's legal lethal injection, which is believed to be more humane, um, may make this stand out as an outlier that, you know, perhaps supports a challenge at the court. Um, again, 
the composition of this Supreme Court um, may not necessarily be amenable to taking up a challenge like that. But I mean, the fact that we're going to firing squads feels a little regressive in 2021, um, regardless of how you feel about the death penalty. Yeah, just a bit. Uh, Professor Melissa Murray, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone check out Strict, uh, Strict Scrutiny. Fantastic podcast uh, with you and Kate Shaw and Leah, uh, Leah Littman. Uh, thank you so much and come back anytime. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Professor Murray for joining us today. Uh, appreciate it. And everyone have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>